Pay close attention. What you're about to see is Bible prophecy being fulfilled. Welcome to another edition of YPN News, bringing you the news that relates to Bible prophecy and foretold by Yeshua Hawkins. Well, unemployment rates hit record numbers as Americans struggle now to stay afloat. Right. Uh, also, China is under pressure as questions are being raised just on how they handled that uh, the initial outbreak of the coronavirus mm -hmm. and you know mm -hmm. what steps were taken. Did they act fast enough and so forth? Right. And along with that, um, some. Uh, U.S. senators are actually demanding that China pay up, like mm. they are the ones responsible. Uh, but also with China, President Trump, is he going to consider loosening some of these tariffs mm -hmm. because the medical supplies that the United States needs, actually some of that is coming from China. So interesting, we'll have those details as well. Um, but first, the Smithfield Pork Factory, located in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, has become the largest coronavirus hotspot in the U.S. Now, the CDC sent medical experts to visit the plant where almost 600 workers have tested positive for the virus. And some employees say that they felt pressured to keep coming to work even after they became sick. Hmm. Well, while the Smithfield food plant temporarily closed, some essential workers were still asked to report to work. The factory employs 4,000 people, mainly immigrants who speak 80 languages. Now, one worker, a mechanic, told CBS News on a scale uh, from 1 to 10, uh, being the most afraid, that is 10 being the most afraid, people in this community uh, range from 8 to 10. Uh, he knew of one person who quit out of fear they would actually contract the virus. But Smithfield is not an isolated case. Meat plants across the country have closed due to outbreaks. According to CBS News, who obtained video footage inside the JB meat plant in Nebraska, they were not following social distancing guidelines. In a statement from Smithfield, CEO Ken Sullivan, uh, he explained, they're doing everything in their power to help prevent their team members from COVID-19, including providing protective gear. Well, even though the curve has just begun to flatten, governors in seven Midwestern states are trying to coordinate how and when they will reopen. Ohio plans to let its stay-at-home order expire on the 1st of May, with some safeguard measures uh, to continue. In a briefing, Ohio Governor Mike DeWine said, The world that we're going to see is a different world. The workplace is going to change. Well, he explained people will continue to wear masks and hand sanitizer will be everywhere. But some states are much more cautious, like Los Angeles and Washington, D.C., who have extended their stay-at-home orders until May 15th. Governor Cuomo, who is at the country's epicenter in New York, also extended their orders, saying, what happens after that date? I don't know. We will see, depending on what the data shows. Now, right now, the data is promising, showing, uh, uh, showing that the death tolls there and the ICU administrations are both down for two days in a row. But like Governor Cuomo has said in the past, we're not just going to take one day. We're going to look at the curve, you know, like a three-day right. uh, process there and see if it's going down. Well, the, the strain of this pandemic on America uh, is easy to see by the length of food lines. With tens of millions of people now unemployed, food insecurity is a big concern across the country. There are many getting in food lines who have never had to do so before. The car lines stretch for blocks and many wait for hours to receive much needed supplies like milk, bread and eggs. The National Guard is assisting with handing out the donations while it is feared 17 million more Americans will now be facing hunger due to the coronavirus pandemic. Now, some middle class have small savings, which can pay a few months worth of essential bills, but will limit the amount of food they can afford. Uh, to give you an idea, the New Orleans Food Bank provided food to 2,500 families in one day. Uh, they've given out 143,000 pounds of food so far. Uh, the national organization says in order to 
continue to respond to the great need over the next six months. They will need $1.4 billion in additional aid. And I imagine it's only going to get worse because, you know, we're still catching up to everybody who's been unemployed. So That's if they right. did have a little bit of savings, it's being used up. That's correct. Well, we now turn to another growing crisis that has resulted from the pandemic. America's nursing homes are suffering growing losses of the elderly. They are so overwhelmed, it is hard to keep up with family members who are heartbroken and enraged. New Jersey is especially hit hard with 95% of its long-term care facilities having cases of the virus. Mm -hmm. Now the state's largest facility has revealed a horrifying problem. They were storing bodies in a morgue designed for a very temporary use. Mm -hmm. They were just piling up. Wow. Authorities say 17 bodies were discovered crammed into a small morgue at the Andover Subacute Re Rehabilitation uh, Center this past weekend. Uh, the discovery was made after one employee made a frantic call to her congressman, Representative Josh uh, Gothheimer. Uh, he told NBC News she asked for help with extra body bags because they were out. It was such a crisis mode, he said. I bet. Well, New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy said he was outraged but the fact that by the fact that the bodies were allowed to pile up like that. He stated, New Jerseyans living in our long-term care facilities deserve to be cared for with respect, compassion, and dignity. We can and must do better. Well, one owner of the Ando of Andover told NBC News, our heroic healthcare staff has been working relentlessly to contain the virus. But that wasn't the case for Lee Rapos, uh, 84 year old mother who died there three weeks ago. She explained to NBC News, they told us there were no cases originally and then to find out that this COVID-19 was basically running rampant in the nursing home. Well, from NBC News findings, they have counted 5,670 deaths in 3,466 nursing home facilities nationwide. And with families desperate for information about their loved ones, they are growing more impatient with the facilities. In Florida now, nursing homes are seeking help from the governor to protect them against lawsuits from families of those in their care. Mm. Uh, but the governor there is worried that they are not taking enough precautions to keep employees from showing up sick after seven deaths at Atria Willowwood Nursing Home. Yeah, and you've got that issue there also with the, uh, the asymptomatic That's right. people who don't know that they have it, but don't could actually be symptoms, yes, could spreading that to other susceptible persons. Well, the facility responded saying the governor's co comments were, quote, inaccurate and unproductive uh, and inconsistent with substantial and urgent steps that they had been taking. Well, some experts also show there is a problem with staff showing up for work because they are scared. Uh, Harvard Medical School professor David uh, Grabowski told NBC News, staffing is the number one issue right now. Many of them are making close to minimum wage, he said. I think there's a real feeling that, hey, I did not sign up for this. Right. They think, well, it's probably not worth it, you know, to yeah. get sick, you know, better for them not to show up is, is what they're thinking. Right. Well, Medicare says it's working with the CDC to get clearer data and will provide more information soon, but it's not soon enough for people like Sheila Curran, whose husband passed away. She told NBC reporters, I want more information. I want more transparency. I want people to own up to their part in this and I want him back. Well, Tehran's Grand Bazaar, with its uh, 10 kilometers of corridors, are the beating heart of the ancient city. But due to the coronavirus, its heart is not beating with as much strength these days. Stay-at-home orders are still in effect, so the call to pray goes out from empty mosques. However, essential businesses are still open, like bread makers, to make sure there is enough food for everyone. Now, one bread maker said... Our work is easy, we're comfortable, we have no problems, but nobody brings us hand sanitizer, disinfectant, or masks. The government brought nothing. We have to pay for it from our own pocket. Hmm. Well, COVID-19 has done something that for many years, U.S. economic sanctions could not do, and that is to bring Iran's economy to an almost complete halt. While President Hassan Rouhani is encouraging Iranians to return to work because it's now safe enough, the chairman of Tehran's city council is more cautious, telling Al Jazeera, 
We are concerned about another outbreak in Tehran. We expect the National Counter Corona Task Force to use the city's council's experience to make more realistic decisions. But people are eager to get back to work. As you can see, uh, there's already traffic jams in the streets again. However, health experts warn that it is too soon to relax these guidelines that took weeks to implement and could risk a second outbreak there. Now, the government is determined, despite the warnings and risk, to reopen Iran's roads and shops in order to save its economy. Well, we're going to uh, look at how the coronavirus is also affecting people, as we talked about the food lines earlier, uh, people uh, with the job losses. Uh, 17 million more people are expected to file for unemployment, and that's not where they expect it to stop. Larry has more for us regarding unemployment and how coronavirus is affecting it. Larry, what do you have for us? Now that many people are paying attention, the world's leading experts are warning us that the microbial onslaught evacuating lives throughout the planet by the thousands is merely the first manifestation of the transgenerational damage perpetuated against the mighty masses of the microbial world through human activities. The radicalized, numberless invisibles have apparently developed emetic intentions, which have in their execution created as much of a disruption to the human world as the human world has created for the kingdoms of microbes through generations of flagrant immorality and intemperance. As the economic structures of the nation struggle to absorb the relatively light blow of the coronavirus, one consequence of the instability has been joblessness. Just this last week, 5.2 million Americans filed unemployment claims, which brings the total to 22 million over the last four weeks. With over 650,000 reported cases of the affliction and 32,000 reported deaths, the fear now is that if steps aren't taken soon, the economy might also require a burial. Due to the economic fallout of the blight, analysts are sensing the seeds of poverty, which they fear will blossom into famine, the beginnings of which can already be seen in the thousands flocking to food banks for assistance. For every one diagnosed case of the affliction, 35 Americans are reported to have lost their jobs, with some states having lost as much as 20% of their workforce. Personal stories from those struggling to stay afloat amid the plague are heartbreaking, not the least of which are husbands and expecting fathers who describe the crisis as the most stressful time in their lives, trying to provide for a family with the world collapsing around them. When the problems are this extensive, there has to be someone around to blame, and at the moment, that someone seems to be China, though there is ample science to suggest that the semi-zoonotic affliction has been globally present and mutating for years. Claims are now that China exposed the world to the virus by not reporting its wounds six days earlier than it chose to. Senator and member of the U.S. Intelligence Committee Tom Cotton is one of those endeavoring to attribute all of America's deaths from the virus to Beijing, as well as its economic losses, which he asserts are all a product of Chinese laboratorial negligence and some say worse. Author of The Coming Collapse of China, Gordon Chang, uses words like malign to describe China's role in the matter, and he believes undeniable culpability can be found in China's misrepresenting information and the large gaps between when it was aware of and chose to report information. Defense Secretary Mike Esper is not an official fan of the laboratory theory and believes that the affliction is an environmental development as opposed to a man-made concoction. He has stated that when the crisis is passed, a better opportunity will be be available to examine the crisis and ascertain origins and hold discussions about what might be done to prevent future such occurrences. Nonetheless, American analysts say that the Chinese government has been very dishonest in its dealings with the nations concerning the incident and has created a great deal of suspicions and questions that it would be better off answering sooner rather than later. For IPN News, I'm Larry McGee. Time, Jeff. Back to you. Well, as you can see, it looks like a little bit more pressure being put on China to mm -hmm. answer those questions. Not sure if they'll get any answers to the questions, but um, as Senator Tom Cotton was trying to say China is responsible, that right. is going to just increase the already bad tensions there between the U.S. and China. That's correct. Well, a French NATO ship off the coast of South France has reported one out of every three of its naval personnel or 668 of the 1,797 have tested positive for COVID-19. Now the ship named Charles du Galais uh, re returned to port after 40 
of its crew experienced symptoms while out at sea. Now, all of the crew were placed in quarantine after docking at port. In mid-March, there were three positive cases reported. By April, that number had jumped to 114. Mm -hmm. Now, the captain's letter regarding the spread of the disease was somehow leaked, mm -hmm. and he was later removed from command. Wow. NATO Secretary General believes the problem doesn't just lie at sea, but has accused Russia of trying to exploit the pandemic, stating in an address, the security challenges have not diminished because of COVID-19. Potential adversaries will look to exploit the situation to further their own interests. Now we see a continued pace of Russian military activity and our forces, he said, remain vigilant and prepared and ready to respond to any threat. Well, as the world faces the effects of the pandemic, the medical items continue to be in short supply. Trump administration's tariffs on China could actually worsen the pandemic as a result. Onifa Steffes, the vice president and chief pharmacy officer at Northwell Health, said everyone has been discussing the requirements for more vents, but no one is discussing the need for the patients when they are on the vents or sedatives and anesthetics and so forth. That's right. It's sad that the patients are the ones to suffer as a result of these uh, tit for tats. Well, the supply is not able to keep up with the demand due to, or in part, to a 25% tariff on Chinese goods, tariffs which the Trump administration is not willing to completely lift. Some of those items are essential and cannot be replaced like hospital bed sheets, uh, machines that deliver anesthesia and hand sanitizer. Uh, consumers are having to pay a king's ransom for something we desperately need to give them and they can't afford to live without, said Michael Kaplan. Uh, he's the president of K7 Design Group Incorporated. Well, companies are pushing for the tariffs to be lifted, saying that it's necessary to fight the pandemic. But a U.S. trade representative doesn't agree, saying imposing tariffs on goods from China as part of the Section 301 action, the U.S. determined to not impose tariffs on certain ventilators, oxygen masks, and nebulizers. Exclusions have been granted for a large number of health-related products, and the tariffs have not resulted in an overall decline in the ability of needed medical equipment supplies. Yeah, hmm. interesting. Well, Joseph Gregory Mahoney, a, a politics ed professor for East China University, said in an interview with RT, there has been a lot of debate as to whether or not we're seeing the emergence of a new world order and whether or not China is winning. And what we're going to see is a doubling, he said, doubling down on the commitment to this strategy. And Trump's strategy is to try to contain things until we get to the warmer months and hope for a vaccine as a silver bullet. Well, South Korea is seeing a huge turnaround in the number of new cases of COVID-19. Now, the numbers skyrocketed in early March from dozens to thousands, but now they're reporting the lowest number of new cases, just 64 in a day since their peak weeks ago, and they didn't lock down entire cities. Mm -hmm. Now, experts say quick action from the beginning was the key, and that included social distancing, contract tracing, widespread testing, and early preparation. That's right. Both South Korea and the U.S. reported their first case of COVID-19 on the same day, which is January 20th. But South Korea did something the U.S. has not, implemented a system to electronically track people and the disease. For instance, a person that tests positive for the virus, uh, the government uses cell phone data and credit card information to track whether that person has been at home or out potentially spreading the virus. And with that, they are able to alert or send an alert to the cell phones of people who might have cross that person's path. Another example of South Korea's initiative in the U.S., N95 masks are not recommended unless a person is sick. In South Korea, the masks are in wide use and encouraged by the government. Now in South Korea, everyone seems to be taking the warning very seriously. That's right. And you know, a lot of people are really taking everything that we see taking place in the world and how this uh, COVID-19 has affected so many different parts of life economically, um, you know, food shortages, and of course right. the health of the people. People are realizing that how vulnerable we as a society are and then these little tit for tats we have going on between nations with tariffs and sanctions you know it just it just makes the problem even worse right. well if you'd like to find out more about these stories you can contact the house of yahweh when you do don't forget to request your free copy of the prophetic word magazine and monthly newsletter here's how 
to contact the House of Yahweh, you can write them at The House of Yahweh, P.O. Box 2498, Abilene, Texas, 79604. You can call them at 1-800-613-9494. Visit them on any of their websites by going to Yahweh.com, YeshuaHawkins.com, or Yahweh'sBranch.com. You can also visit our website by going to YPNNews.com. If you would like to email the House of Yahweh, you can do so by emailing info at Yahweh.com. For any international calls, you can call the number that's on your screen now. And once again, you can check out the Yisrael Says program by going to YisraelSays.com or the Ask Yisrael program by going to AskYisrael.com. Well, don't go anywhere. Up next, a very informative message from Yisrael Hawkins that's guaranteed to give you some insight on what you can do to protect yourself and your family from the plagues that are affecting all of mankind. From all of us here at YPN News, I'm Gatan Alexander. And I'm Jeffrey Heimerman. Thank you for watching. Thank you.